Hello and welcome to this Yuma webinar. Um, this is a completely new experience for me, so please bear with me. Um, I'm hoping you can hear what I'm saying and I will try not to talk too fast, as is my want. Um, we're going to be talking about, um, I can, well, I'm going to be talking about the UK experience of what's happening over in the UK for with regard to wound care at this interesting time with COVID-19. Um, I'm going to give a presentation which I expect to last about 10 minutes um, and then we can take questions. Um, and so I believe you should be able to see a question panel. Um, if you want to type your questions in the question panel, um, we will address those at the end, but please don't wait until the end to type your questions. Feel free if a question occurs to you during the presentation, just type it in and then when I get to the end of the presentation, I'll go back and I will address the questions to the best of my ability. Um, I'm told that the webinar will be available on the Yuma website, um, uh, presumably tomorrow, um, but it will become available. So let's start. Um, that's what I said. COVID-19 is obviously having a big impact on everyone who provides wound care and all healthcare services are facing reduced staff numbers. This, this might be for a number of reasons. Obviously, clinicians are not immune to COVID-19, so some of them are getting sick. Um, their families get sick and their loved ones, so there's a need for self-isolation if their families develop symptoms. And of course, many, many staff are being redeployed to areas of the greatest need. Um, so there's an increased workload anticipated for healthcare professionals working in both acute and community settings. In the acute setting, obviously, there's the hugely increased number of coronavirus admissions. Um, but in, and in the community, obviously, people get sick in the community. Certainly in the UK, we're seeing a large number of people being becoming ill in care homes. But also, um, there's been a rapid discharge of hospital patients. Um, people who were in hospital have been moved out to receive care in the community. Um, plus, of course, um, the community staff are being asked to do everything they can to prevent pe patients having to be admitted to hospital. Um, now, in the UK, and I'm, I'm aware this is not the same necessarily elsewhere, but in the UK, most patients with chronic wounds receive care from a nurse working in either the patient's home in community nursing or in general practice nursing. Um, and we are hearing reports of patients struggling to get adequate room, room care for a number of reasons. Um, practice nurse appointments are being cancelled, patient visits are being cancelled, and some patients are having difficulty getting access to dressings or equipment. Now, in normal times, wound care is estimated to constitute about 50% of the community nursing workload in the UK. So this is obviously a big change for community nursing. Um, there are, of course, the, the situation does present us with opportunities. Um, for example, if we can work out, initi um, develop initiatives that reduce the amount of time spent on wound care, we could release significant community time to care. Um, but of course, there are risks because if care is withheld from patients with chronic wounds, this will increase demand on community and hospital services due to delayed healing, increased incidence of uncontrolled exudate, wound infection and cellulitis. So there is a, on the one hand, we want to encourage people to, um, to share care, to look after themselves as far as is safe, but we want to make sure that's done in a way that does not um, increase the burden further down the line. On the 19th of March, um, NHS England and NHS Improvement, which is our policy guidance, issued advice on the current priorities for community healthcare providers in England. And they have advised that we should be using telemedicine options wherever it is clinically safe to do so. Um, interestingly, the digital arm of the NHS, which is NHS X, has permitted the use of commercial apps for video conferencing to carry out consultations with patients and service users. So these are the sort of apps that we might use to speak to our families or whoever, things like, and I don't want to advertise, but well, you know the sort I'm talking about, Zoom, um, 
all sorts of other type FaceTime, those sort of apps that normally we would just use in our private lives. Digital X have said that it is in these times it is appropriate to consider using those for patient and service users. Um, I'm the director of the National Wound Care Strategy Program, and we've we've been supporting clinicians to offer opportunities for self care um, to patients and carers by producing information and shared care documentation, which can be found on our website. Now, I've on the slide you'll see that I've put a link to that. I'm afraid it's a hyperlink, and I don't think it'll work on the download. But if you just Google National Wound Care Strategy Program, hopefully it will turn up. Certainly for those of you in the UK. Um, so there are documents there which may be useful, um, which you are very welcome to access and adapt or adopt, whichever, if that would be helpful to you. If we look at the topic of diabetic foot ulcers and high-risk vascular feet, in the UK, as always, um, care should follow the NICE clinical guideline for diabetic foot problems. Um, and the advice from NHS England and NHS Improvement in relation to COVID-19 has stated that review of post-surgical high-risk diabetic foot ulcers in outpatient clinics should continue along with podiatry and podi podiatric surgery for high-risk vascular diabetic feet and diabetic foot clinics. Interestingly, I was speaking to a colleague this morning who's telling me that although the NHS is still wishing to provide this care, she is having great difficulty in persuading patients to come into clinic to receive that care and has serious concerns that patients may be placing themselves at greater risk from their uh, unmanaged diabetic foot than from the risk of COVID. It's a very difficult one to judge, but we certainly clinicians are starting to report serious concerns to me, but that is not advice that is coming from top down. That is what they're hearing from their patients. Um, the NHS Diabetes Programme has also advised that patients with diabetes foot ulceration are at high risk of foot-related emergency admission, and they are encouraging the development of individual care plans with the diabetes multidisciplinary foot teams to enable some dressings to be completed at home um, to minimise outpatient clinic attendance. And again, they are also encouraging the use of teletriage before any home visits. Um, again, the issue seems to be whether this is being accepted by patients and, and or whether this is actually being proactively done by services. Um, we also, uh, the Foot in Diabetes UK has produced um, advice on preventing lower limb amputation to try and help decision making at this difficult time. We have paste, um, posted these documents on our website, on the National Wind Care Strategy Programme website. So if you are wanting to have a look at that, you should be able to find it there. With regard to pressure ulcers, um, similarly, pressure ulcer prevention care should be in line with the existing NICE clinical guideline for pressure ulcers, um, which I believe is very, very similar to the EPOAP guidance. Um, in Britain, or in England certainly, um, there has been some work done to provide information advice to support patients and carers and this can be found on the react to red website and i'm getting some very positive feedback from people who are discovering this for the first time and finding it enormously helpful at this time so we're very lucky that some work had already been done in this area which we could just simply raise awareness of rather than having to write from basics there's also issues around lymphedema as you'll know, unmanaged lymphedema increases the chances of cellulitis and thus increases the chance of hospital admission, which obviously nobody wants. So it's important that people with lymphedema have access to the garments and materials they need to manage their lymphedema. Again, we have heard some stories that some people are having problems. We don't know how widespread this is. But again, the British Lymphology Society has produced an advice sheet for people with pre-existing lymphedema to help them optimise the opportunities for self-care. And again, we have placed this, um, this advice on our website. If you do go to the National Wound Care Strategy um, Programme website, I do apologise. We were in the middle of trying to improve the layout of it. It's not the easiest thing to navigate, so I can only apologise in advance. But I promise you these documents are there. 
certainly in the UK, leg ulcers are the biggest proportion of wounds by far that, that we have to deal with. Um, we have been advised that we should prioritise care for infected wounds, um, wounds where there is heavy exudate, compression bandaging that's been in situ for more than seven days and complex wounds. And we would argue that any leg ulcer or foot ulcer for that matter, by definition, is a complex wound. It's a wound that is unlikely or far less likely to heal by itself without the appropriate interventions. Um, we are advising that um, for people with, and I say we, that's the National Wound Care Strategy Programme, for people with leg ulcers with an adequate arterial supply, self-care opportunities can be increased by offering compression hosiery or wraps. There's good evidence for compression hosiery. The evidence for wraps is not as robust. And in fact, we have a new um, NHS funded trial that's just starting, um, was planning to start recruitment this, um, this autumn. Um, so we know the evidence isn't as strong, but I think in times like these, um, we need to opt, well, the most important thing is we get people into some form of compression, providing they've got an arterial supply, a good and adequate arterial supply. Um, there's interesting discussions. We've posted some links to the um, to um, the YouTube videos on how to apply compression hosiery, compression wraps, but also compression bandaging. And I'm quite intrigued because I'm picking up some feedback from some clinicians saying, why are we encouraging people to do compression bandaging? But I think it's a case of assessing the ability of um, that particular patient and their carers as to whether it's appropriate or not, because some patients are not appropriate for hosiery or wraps, in which case we need to think about, do they have somebody who it would be safe to help them apply compression bandaging? I don't think I could apply my own compression badge, I'll be honest. But if I was in that situation, I would trust someone to teach my husband to apply it for me. Um, I should point out my husband works in chocolate. He is not a clinician, but he's a sensible person most of the time. So I think we need to open our minds to thinking about individualised um, approaches to how we do this. For existing patients, we should do our very best to continue the evidence-based care that hopefully is already providing. Um, for new patients, um, ideally, obviously, we would like to be able to, to undertake the vascular assessment that we need to do in order to assess arterial supply, but that simply may not be possible in the current climate, depending on work, workload demands. With the new National Wound Care Strategy Programme lower limb recommendations, we, had, we have recommended that for patients, unless there are obvious reasons why they should not be going into any form of compression. And by that, I mean obvious arterial insufficiency, you know, black toes, that sort of thing. We are recommending um, mild compression. And so we would suggest that during COVID-19, if it's not possible to do a vascular assessment, at least get these patients into mild compression. For surgical wounds, as for other conditions, it makes sense where possible to offer opportunities for self-care to be offered to patients and carers. I had been asked whether we could produce some advice on removing sutures and clips, and we, after discussion with some colleagues, we felt this was maybe a step too far. But um, we do think that, that, that with good advice, people probably can do their own, providing it's a straightforward dressing. They probably can be provided with the resources and information to do that. And again, on our website, we've posted videos of how to do this and also documentation telling people how to actually do addressing. And we developed this very quickly in consultation with patients and carers. And again, feedback to date has been quite positive. You're very welcome to take a look. One of the areas I'm particularly concerned about, though, is the PPE skin damage to um, clinicians working in um, high risk COVID-19 areas. I've been quite shocked by the pictures and um, I, I've got an image here on this slide. Um, we have looked to international advice. Um, some advice has been developed in England and I believe that has just been approved. So as we hope to get that posted on our website as well. Um, it's very difficult. Most of the advice seems to be around actually preventing the damage happening in the first place and some advice on um, various dressings, um, barrier products that may be useful. The evidence base for this is obviously 
um, weak, but that doesn't mean to say they don't work. Um, so I think we really are just having to, this one is a case of try it and see what might help. It's a tricky one. I think there's also issues here around service organisation. The COVID-19 situation is forcing healthcare organisations to rethink how they organise their services to meet the health needs of their populations. And in the UK, certainly many organisations are redeploying their specialist wound care nurses to deliver care as part of the adult community nursing service. Um, it's interesting. Um, some nurses are coming back to me saying they are finding that just by being out there with the nurses, their expertise and education skills are hopefully going to increase the provision of evidence-based care and the uptake of shared care and self-care, we'll see. Um, NHS England and NHS Improvement have also advised that maybe podiatry staff could be redeployed to provide wound care. And this is certainly something we've been talking about with podiatrists about where can we do more joined up care anyway? Um, so this is a, an area where we were already starting to explore. We have a problem in the UK that we have a desperate shortage of podiatry staff. So it's not that we have got loads of these staff um, available to take on this care. We haven't, we're short of them. Um, NHS E and NHS I are also advising health and care social so health and social care providers to agree roles to avoid duplication. We've been, again, this, we've argued this for years. So can we try and work out how we can work better, more collaboratively to provide the care that's needed? There's also a particular call out to consider support for homeless and rough sleepers who cannot self-isolate. Um, in the UK, the, the homeless have disappeared off the streets. I understand they, they're being rehoused in a variety of places. But our concern is whether they're getting the health care they need while they're there. Again, a colleague has told me um, that they've had a patient come into clinic because they couldn't get care anywhere else. And their ulcerated leg was they, they were they were covering it with nappies because that was the only disposable nappies. They were the only absorbent dressings, what for better word, they're not dressings they were able to find. So I think we have probably a hidden crisis on our hands there. We also need to think how we support the um, care homes more fully because they are having a terrible time. And that, a lot of that may well be through um, telephone consultation um, and support, but they, they really, really need our help at this time. One other suggestion, which is potentially controversial, but I find very interesting, is that um, specialist services should maybe consider using pharma nurses, those nurses who are employed by industry, to offer support for the care of patients with specialist devices on them. Patients, for example, things like neck, a patient already has negative wound pressure therapy. Could the support for that negative wound pressure therapy actually be provided by the company rather than by the usual nurses? So that's an interesting one to chew over. So that gets me to the end. Have I, oh, slightly longer than I said, but still plenty of time for questions. That gets me to the end of my presentation. I can't see any questions as yet in the, in the box, um, or maybe there is one, but let's switch over to questions now. First question I've got is, what will be the risk for SARS-CoV-19 infection using ultrasonic debridement? Should we avoid this procedure in a patient with COVID-19? I'll be honest, I have no idea whatsoever, but I am um, i i don't know is the honest answer. And I always find it best to be honest, I'm afraid. Um, I would have thought if this was an essential procedure, then presumably you would follow the surgical guidelines because this is a form of surgery. There must be surgical guidelines out there for um, treating COVID-19 patients. So that's where I would probably signpost you to for that one. Um, no question, but thank you. You're very welcome. Help, right. That might be help with the IT or it might be, let's have a look, see if I can open this one up. What do you see as the role of technology in wound care at this time? Newer technologies that could help. I completely agree with you. I think we have a saying in England, it's an ill wind that blows, brings no good. And I think um, we are being forced into using technologies that we have maybe shied away from. I mean, webinar today is an example of that. 
one of the things we are particularly interested in with the National Wind Care Strategy Program in England is the um, digital data capture technologies that are appearing, um, technologies that allow um, information routinely to be downloaded, and that includes images onto the patient's record. Um, so I think that would be, if only we had access like that, rather than having to rely on paper, that would be a big step forward. So I completely agree with you. But also, I think loosening up about how we use technologies to undertake routine. It's interesting, uh, um, someone I know had at the beginning of the um, COVID-19 situation, they had um, a flare-up of eczema on their hand, young person, um, and normally they'd have had to make an appointment, they'd have had to wait a week or two to see the GP. But because COVID was starting to blow up, they, um, they rang up the surgery, the surgeon said, well, the GP can't see you, but um, would you accept a telephone conversation? They did. She has a. She, they were able to. Um, she was able to show the um, GP what the skin looked like. The, the GP was happy to prescribe. It was sorted. Mutual convenience for the GP and for the patient. And I think we could be doing a lot more of this than we do. I don't. I don't know if anybody's online from New Zealand, but I spent some time out there um, a couple of years ago. And the nature of the country, they have to do a lot online, and they do it very, very well. And I think there are real opportunities to do more of this. So yes, certainly we'll be recommending this from the national programme, but I think we'll be learning an awful lot during this time as well. Right, let me see if I can find the next question. So I'm a bit clunky with the um, questions. Ah, oh, turning times. What can you advise to patient to nurses handling COVID patients on turning times in ICU since they're trying to implement minimal contact with patients? Yes, it's always down to the balance of risk, isn't it? It's um, it's the balance of risk from pressure damage if you don't give the correct care versus the damage of risk to um, infection. And I'm also, I mean, I'm I'm not. I put my hands on. I'm not an acute nurse. I'm my background's in community, but I think the principles are probably the same. Um, I'm, I presume in other countries there's also a move towards what's called proning nursing patients on their front. Um, so I think as well, it's I've I've always had my doubts about these rigid you must turn patients too early because obviously it does vary according to the patient's skin. But if you're getting evidence of skin damage, then clearly the patient would ideally need turning. But if turning the patient means that you increase the risk of harm to the patient from another cause, I think you have to make that decision on an individual case by case basis. Again, I'm afraid there are no quick and easy answers. The trouble with questions, though, and I used to be a tissue viability nurse, I found most questions were from clever nurses who probably um, were asking the questions that all of us struggle with. Um, but let's see. Let's see. Need, sorry, I'm just trying to get to the top of this one. Um, UK related question. <laughs> Are you aware of any financial commitment from government to the NHS for the medium to long term to pick up the pieces? i.e. if diabetic foot ulcers are not attending and therefore may deteriorate need more intensive management. No, I am not aware of that and I wish I was. At the moment I am still struggling. To, we were promised funding for the programme and I'm still struggling to get an answer out of the, out of the um, NHS as to whether our funding will continue. So no, I have, I'm afraid I have nothing on that. I can assure you though we will be pressing for that because we're recognising that the situation is probably building up a backlog and a backlog of patients with probably greater needs than before the situation. So yes, you you, um, you have my sympathy with that one and I can't give you an answer, but I, yes, it's on our list as well. Right, have I got all the questions? Are there any others? Let's have a look. Um, and there's one from Sonia. Is telenursing used, if so nationwide? Sonia, if you're asking us if we have a wonderful IT system across the country, no, we don't. That is the answer to that. Telenursing, though, I think is the way forward. I think it's definitely things we can learn at the moment. And I think we need to think about for when this is situation subsides. And the reality is this isn't going to subside overnight. This is going to hopefully ease a bit, but we are going to have to think about new ways of working. And I completely agree. I think telenursing is one way forward. It cannot replace the face to face. Um, one thing that's been um, talking to colleagues, um, people have said, well, they're, they're finding telenursing works pretty well with people. It's not their first time they've met, but when it's a new patient, you really need that for that time and that face-to-face -face conversation. So I think there is a role. We're going to have to work out where that role is. 
but yes. Right, I'm just trying to see if there's anything else. What time are we on? Oh, we're okay for time. Are wraps, that's a, are wraps with measurable compression devices not safer than, it says MLB, but I think that's multi-layer bandaging. Who knows? Um, they're not safer if they don't, what we don't know is the relative risk. I think you're probably right, but I think it depends on the hands. I would not wish to put somebody into bandaging unless I was confident about their ability to do it safely. So I would be extremely cautious about handing over compression bandaging. But that's the point I was trying to make is I don't think it's a definite no. And I know there are places where this happens quite safely. Wraps potentially do seem safer, but if the patient doesn't want to wear a wrap, or if you've got somebody um, who will remove the wrap as soon as it's on, then that might not be the right answer. So I think you're right. And I think there is a move towards that. Um, and it will be very interesting to find out um, the effectiveness, but we won't know that for three or four years and we can't wait that long. So you're right, we need to be thinking about what we can do now. Yeah, um, potentially yes, but but that may not be the right answer for every single patient. Let me go a bit higher and see if I can find anything else. What are the implications from the legal perspective giving care to a wound by telemedicine or phone consultation? That will vary, I guess, on where you're working. In the UK, because we, because our organisation has given us permission and is encouraging us to do that, I think that gives us legal protection, or as good as it can be. Obviously, we still need to be working within our professional um, guidelines. That that goes without question. But I think in some ways in the UK, well, certainly in England, um, because NHS England and NHS Improvement and NHS X have all said use telemedicine, use digital where you can, that I think that gives us some legal protection. I guess it will depend on your different countries, um, what your different countries have said to that. And it's probably worth pressing them for some guidance if you don't have it. Um, if diabetic foot ulcer patients are not attending and therefore may deteriorate, do they need more intensive management? Yes, but the problem we've got is that they are um, not only are they not attending, they're not wanting input either from nurses or the visiting nurses are um, are not willing to prioritise, even though the guidance says they should. So I agree with you. They definitely need some. They need something, and I think we're going to have to deal with that. Certainly, I don't know those of you in the UK who've watched the news. Um, there's a worrying trend that um, they're seeing. An, a larger number of deaths than they would have expected, even with COVID-19. They're wondering if some of that might be, for example, heart attacks brought on by um, um, stress from living with from COVID-19. But also, I'm hearing stories about people not um, receiving care because they're too scared to go and get the care. Um, I was told a horror story yesterday. Apparently, a GP had had two children die from um, sepsis because the parents left it too late or did not seek advice. So it's it's a tricky one. We have a we have an issue in the UK at the moment that while people are obeying the lockdown, they may be taking it too, too far and extreme when they really do need some help. Um, that's difficult for us to address on an individual basis. I think that needs to come from the Department of Health. Um, and I don't, you know, we can do what we can, but I think we need some top-down guidance to people to make sure that isn't happening. There is advice out there, but I don't think the message is clear enough yet. Um, we're using telemedicine to support care and wound care. Good for you. Well done. The main challenge appears to be the availability of smart devices and for the TV ends, a long wait to prepare the resident for assessment. Um, do you have any ideas how this could be improved? I think probably with practice we'll get slicker. I'm, I'm guessing um, it's whether it seems to be the advice from NHSX seems to be that um, using any device is preferable to using none. And it's probably those that communication with a care home to try to get them to actually um, to prepare the patient for the assessment um, in advance of turning up. And again, that's probably going to be down to phone calls and coordination. But it must be terribly difficult for the care homes where they've got so many sick patients and dying patients that, you know, it, they're, they're being pulled from all edges. 
I, I don't, again, I'm sorry, I don't have any easy answers, but I think it comes down to communication, support for each other and kindness and tolerance about how we try and improve things. Tricky, tricky stuff. There's another one. Um, Australia, hello Australia. I think this crisis will change the way we provide wound care going to the future. I'm concerned about the legal ramifications of providing wound care from a distance. Yes, I agree. E.g. Um, providing patient care um, or the care care advice to self-care for their chronic wounds. What are your thoughts? I agree. I think we don't, we've got to be careful how we go into this. But I think what's concerning me is not providing any care at all is also dangerous. I'm hearing stories of people saying, well, we can't go and care, you've just got to get on with it. And I, to me, that seems neglect of our professional duty. I think we've got to be brave, we've got to do the best we can, and we've got to tread carefully. But treading carefully is different from turning our backs on it. So, and I think we will learn more. Um, I think it is a challenge, though. I agree with you. Um, it's interesting. I'm fascinated by countries like Australia and um, Canada. Canada, I'm so sorry, Canada. Um, because you have such huge geographical areas and I think we'll probably learn more lessons from you um, because you've got this challenge already. Um, I don't know if anybody from Canada's on the line, but I'm aware they've been doing some stuff for some years. Do I think, did I answer that? Do I think this may have a beneficial impact in the longer term where areas are now adopting self-care? This may become more routine moving forward. Yeah, I think it will. What kind of PPA should we use? I'm sorry, that's outside my area of knowledge. Um, I would go with whatever your your health provider is recommending. That's all I can say. We, I, I, I don't know on that one. Um, would you expect that we're going to face more serious state chronic, more serious state chronic wounds at the end due to the difficulty of standard care? Yeah, I think you're right. I think um, I think when we come out of this, we're going to be facing people who've had suboptimal care for quite a while and we're going to have to do a lot of work to try and repair that and it's going to be a challenge thank you for the thank yous there's a guideline about this that we recommend on this type of cases stephanie i'm sorry i wasn't sure which guideline you're referring to do you think this may have a beneficial impact long term yep i think i've cancelled that one how do you think industry can best support the nhs at this time um, I think the most helpful thing is making sure that um, that we get supplies out to people who need them. I think there are conversations to be had about um, pharma, the possible redeployment of clinicians working within pharma to maybe support existing services. One of the things that would be really helpful is certainly in the UK, um, I'm aware that pharma produce some beautiful um, educational materials, but so often they are product related sometimes that is appropriate like if it's about a, a type of compression system of course that's appropriate but it would be really helpful if some of the stuff is not could be more generic because then we can use it wherever places are otherwise we have this problem that we are effectively doing marketing and we just more we're not allowed to do that so that would be particularly helpful well done to some companies who've started doing that and thank you very much to those who have um, other nurses. So could this be around developing the support of shared care pathways? I, don't, I think shared care pathways are probably the responsibility of the healthcare providers rather than industry, but that's a personal view. Towards the end, I think time-wise, we're also probably getting towards the end. So I should probably wrap up then. I do apologise if I haven't managed to get to your question in time. I wrote a few questions in case there weren't any. I don't think I needed to worry. Thank you ever so much for attending. I hope this has been helpful. Um, Please stay safe. Um, um, you will receive an email tomorrow um, and which will allow you to request a certificate of attendance. So please look out for that. And in the meantime, um, please stay safe. Carry on washing your hands. On a positive note, I'm told that the respiratory disease burden is going down because there's less pollution. And I'm told that gastroenterologists are a bit quieter because people are washing their hands more. So let's try and look on the bright side. But please, my heart goes out to you for caring for your patients. Difficult times. We've got a difficult time ahead, but please look after yourselves. And thank you for listening. Goodbye.